Good. So, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, to what I will be calling our FrameNet Tuesdays, uh, which, as Tiago already said, were sort of a result of the IFNW workshop um, being well probably cancelled in the end, uh, and that was originally meant to uh, take place at Elric in Marseille in May, uh, and then we came up with the idea to. Uh, hosts a number of sessions and this is the first one and I'm uh, really glad to open it and to open it with a topic then after this will then be continued uh, by uh, Kyoko Ohara so this is a very sort of fitting setting with the two presentations today on pragmatic frames. Uh, so here you see the title Beyond Lexical Semantics Notes on Pragmatic Frames and this is a joint work by myself from the University of Leipzig, Alexander Ziem in Düsseldorf, and Thiago from FrameNet Brazil, located at the University of Juiz Forda. And this is um, one of the results that um, comes from a joint project that is uh, financed or funded by DAAD, so the German Academic Exchange Service and CAPES, uh, CAPES um, the Brazilian equivalent, uh, and it ties in nicely with the uh, number of works uh, that are happening at the different sites. For instance, in Leipzig, uh, the analysis of translation by means of frames and also constructions, uh, or um, the, um, the development of a German framenet and German constructor, Conan Dusseldorf, and uh, a number of uh, projects actually at FrameNet Brazil, such as multimodal annotation or um, machine translation, things around machine translation, like machine translation evaluation by means of frames. And so we will be looking at pragmatics in uh, contexts, in I think a rather fitting context uh, of uh, multilinguality, we could say, in this case, in the context of translation, but we might as well use it or make it useful for other multilingual purposes, such as um, typology, con contrastive analyses, or um, second or foreign language learning, and for instance, L1 effects in foreign language learning, just to name a few examples. So a few words on pragmatic frames. First, of course, this is not a new idea and is rooted in uh, some of the work of uh, Irving Goffman in the 60s and 70s, where he also picks up on the notion of frames and uh, yeah, in that same vein on the notion of interactions and interactional frames. And this, uh, this also appears in Charles Fillmore's early work uh, here I uh, cited the 1977 paper. It's also in the 1982 paper on frame, semantic, frame semantics, where he speaks about scenes, about abstract scene scenarios, um, a term that we would probably have to talk uh, about a little more when we talk about pragmatic frames rather than when we talk about lexical semantics, uh, and a term that probably would have to be uh, somewhat more um, more richly defined to 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 uh, cover that notion of pragmatic frames and what 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 pragmatic frames actually describes, but I'll leave that for the discussion. So when we talk about pragmatic frames, what we're not uh, what we do not mean is sort of the classical uh, lexical semantic, um, let's say, denotation of states, events, attributes, relations, or other things that we could describe as entities, uh, having some sort of uh, entity-like, um, at least conceptualization, if not form. Uh, we also do not mean ad hoc in inferences um, or framing activities. So we're not talking sort of about the pragmatics of framing. So uh, I don't know, framing a group either as protesters or as attackers um, and then trying to sort of highlight certain aspects. That, that's not what we mean. We're really talking about interaction and uh, some sort of conventionalized pragmatics, often also referred to as function, especially in translation studies. So uh, when we ask the question, uh, 
uh, what does this what does this expression what does it mean to do so to speak what is the function of it does it is it meant to be polite informal uh, is it meant to open a conversation to greet someone or to end some sort of interaction this is what we are referring to when we talk about pragmatic frames as opposed uh, to some other words that have a broader well broader notion of pragmatic fr frames i didn't put a lot of citations in here, they're all in the paper, actually quite a few, and I thought uh, that would be rather disturbing for a short presentation, so I left that out. But if you uh, wanna have an overview of this, then uh, please relate to our paper where we're citing some other work. Um, the mini study that I'm presenting here draws on data from the shared annotation task that is happening in the context of uh, the Global Framenet Initiative. And in this context, uh, a text was picked, the TED Talk, Do Schools Kill Creativity by Sir Ken Robinson. It's the most viewed TED Talk so far, uh, and it was already back then. It uh, was subtitled in, um, in English, there was a closed captioning in English, and these subtitles were translated into more than 60 languages. I think the latest count is 63, if I'm not mistaken. And the English version and uh, versions in the other language, such as Brazilian, Portuguese, Japanese, French, and German, were annotated or are being annotated still in various languages with uh, the Berkeley FrameNet frames from the 1.7 uh, release as a basis, and then of course, including specific adjustments for some languages. We use this, uh, we've already made use of this parallel semantic annotation, uh, so to speak, to, um, to test it for various applications. And one of them is to, develop a measure of semantic similarity. So one of the problems in translation, and this is a context of translation now, one of the problems in translation is how to sort of um, draw a border between, well, a translation then maybe something that is, um, maybe uh, some sort of text that has been um, informed uh, or mo motivated by another text, but isn't actually a close translation, well, I'll drop the word close, isn't actually something that we would call a translation in that sense. Um, well, one way or something that, that has been or was discarded uh, pretty early on is to try to find some, some idea of uh, identity, of, of identity of denotation or identity of uh, linguistic items that, that are being used, but that of course uh, doesn't, uh, there are a lot of cases that it doesn't really cover. And uh, a more recent, um, yeah, more recent uh, proposal in terms of uh, when, looking at, when looking at it uh, by means of corpora, so something that has in theory already been sort of discussed and devised, but by means of uh, looking at translations in corpora and trying to analyze uh, translation, to look where they diverge and where they sort of converge, is to um, use measures of semantic similarity. And uh, there was a paper by uh, Thiago and uh, colleagues in 2018. Um, uh, I think it was also Colin Baker and I forgot who else uh, was involved uh, on uh, something that I would call frame overlap. Uh, so that when looking at frame semantic full text annotations of the English original, of the TED talk and then of the Brazilian Portuguese version to look at you know, what sort of kinds of frames are anchored, are being realized in the various, um, in the various language versions and how much do these sort of frame realizations overlap or is there a lot of divergence? Uh, and then we sort of built uh, up on that and um, by means of a spread activation algorithm not just looking sort of at identical frames. So there is frame A in the original and then frame A, so to speak, just in its Brazilian version in the translation, but there is something like frame A2 that is not exactly the same frame, but it's closely related to the frame that was used in English. Um, 
So we'd not just have to look at frame identity, but also at frames that are somehow related and uh, whether they are used as some sort of alternative realization in the translation. And we could use the relations of frames and uh, exploit this sort of frame network by means of a spread activation algorithm and then say for a translation and an original, are they semantically similar or is there some sort of um, substantial uh, divergence. And some sentences stood out as being dissimilar, even though um, to a human reader, uh, they are obviously similar in what they mean to convey. Here are some corpus examples for that. Um, one type uh, of expressions that, uh, well, it does not appear that frequently, of course, in the text, but sort of in all instances, it does not actually yield any kind of similarity between the different language versions uh, that is greetings. So here we have good morning. Uh, that's what the, the TED talk starts, starts with good morning, good morning, then uh, bon dia, good morgen. Um, actually, we don't need a gloss here because this is uh, pretty much a parallel uh, construction or parallelly sort of uh, both syntactically and lexically formed uh, and then already the next greeting um, how are you and then in Portuguese um, como estão and in German wie geht es ihnen there you already see a bit of a formal difference uh, if we were to now annotate um, all the little bits all the sort of lexical units in there uh, with frames then two questions would arise first would that cover the meaning of these expressions actually. So if we now said, okay, in good morning, good is desirability and morning is calendric unit. Is, the, is that what we actually mean? Do we mean a desirable form of a calendric unit? Does that really convey what the expression means to, or does that, is that actually what the expression means to convey? Uh, and then in the case of how are you and wie geht es ihnen, where we have something with go uh, in German happening with the word, verb to go, if we annotated that, then we would get a frame difference because in one case we have something like a state, in the other we have something like a motion. Um, if we annotated it that way, we wouldn't, we, would, we wouldn't necessarily arrive at any sort of measurable similarity. Uh, so what we actually need to describe here um, is the meaning of the expression as a whole. And currently, uh, there is uh, no greeting frame in FrameNet that is uh, meant to be used for this purpose. Uh, so here are a few more um, points on greetings. Beyond these two examples, uh, the problem is that there is a lot of stylistic variation possible. Hey, how do you do? Um, but sort of within these formulae, there is little variation possible, if at all. Uh, and of course, despite the formal differences between the languages and then many other languages, of course, the function is the same in this specific context is sort of to connect with the audience. So there was the opening already with a good morning and then uh, how are you is sort of to connect. And if some somebody were to reply, we would find it somewhat unusual. And uh, as I already said, we probably have to look at these uh, formulae or expressions as expressions as a whole. Another example from the corpus, from the annotations, are tag questions. Um, here the example, it's been great, hasn't it? Um, Tiago, I hope you'll forgive me if I, if I don't read out the Portuguese version. Um, and then in German, es war großartig, nicht wahr? Um, here, between English and Portuguese on the one hand and German on the other hand, and I think it's, yes, it's on the next slide, uh, there is a there is a systematic difference between in terms of form and in terms of sort of uh, if we were to look at the single lexical units that are being used uh, or the single words that are being used there is there is a, a difference a systematic difference where in English and Portuguese this well let's call it construction is more syntactic uh, in nature with often negated verbs and pronouns which open up anaphoric relations to the main clause. Um, so there is something like a, like a like an instantiated semantic relation to what was said 
before. Whereas in German, it's a um, it's a fixed expression, uh, sort of standard um, generic uh, language, nicht wahr? But there's a lot of there's a lot of variation on this regionally, both regionally and stylistically, uh, nicht oder gel war. Uh, so these more regional uh, variants or just shortened variants like nicht or oder. But despite these formal differences, uh, of course, again, here we have functionally comparable expressions across languages that are used for hedging, emphasizing, reassuring, and a lot of other things, uh, you name it, in various contexts. So, um, I'll, I'll go back one slide. So, uh, already in this uh, sort of short, um, and I'll just look at the at my watch for a second. Okay, four minutes left. Um, already in this uh, very short sort of section of the text, so these examples were really just from the first few uh, sentences of the TED talk. We found a number of instances, uh, and, and here we sort of um, listed the more the more prominent ones that um, yes that that are not covered. Uh, in terms of the in terms of how frame semantic corpus annotation has been done so far and uh, and this is probably question and this will be part of the last slide that will have to be uh, discussed a lot and actually before we know how to do this kind of corpus annotation we'd also have to agree upon at least some basics of what we actually think pragmatic frames um, describe and what they are and what they contain. And uh, from what, uh, from the few examples that I just gave you and from the considerations about greetings and tag questions, and as I said, stylistic uh, kinds of variations and so on and so forth, we uh, formulated a few assumptions of uh, about what um, definitions of pragmatic frames may or might involve. Probably not all of these at, at the same time for all pragmatic frames, but uh, the central aspects that we would expect sort of to be relevant uh, in this context would be things such as circumstances, times, formality, info, uh, time, or formality, informality. By time, of course, we mean time of the day, for instance, when do you say, good morning, when do you actually say good afternoon, when do you say good evening, when does the evening start, and so on and so forth. Situational prepositions, including artifacts, uh, such as materials and objects, uh, for instance, water for baptizing, then certain text and sociolinguistic affordances, uh, including choice of register, um, register in terms of uh, more like systemic functional uh, linguistics, including all sorts of uh, variables. What what kind of register am I choosing and what does that actually mean for the type of interaction uh, that is happening? Uh, and then other sociolinguistically relevant factors including various types of variation and roles and statuses of the parties involved, uh, face-saving work uh, and, and so on and so forth. So things that we would, we could integrate where there's a lot of literature on already and that uh, we might integrate. As I said already, um, uh, the annotation of pragmatic frames hasn't uh, um, yeah, so, so far been a practice that, uh, of, of uh, frame annotation or frame net annotation, even though there is, of course, work on pragmatic frames, right? For instance, uh, um, in the Swedish frame net in Constructicon, where um, the sort of the level of pragmatics is one way, uh, one level on which um, constructions can be described and what they sort of, what their semantic contexts, the uh, content is. Um, so yes, there is work, but in terms of, um, I mean, the question, part of the question is how do we, how do we define a frame? If we think of the frame net instead of the frame lexicon, um, what, what would such a definition look like? What would it uh, include? And is it just sort of ju just another type of frame, like an emotion frame or motion frame, or what kind of frame is it? Are they really different in that sense? Um, 
And then in terms of annotation, and this is uh, the last sentence, or, well, one of the last sentences, um, we would assume that pragmatic frames are often at work uh, somehow in the background, even if they're not lexicalized. And in many cases, they aren't lexicalized. And then of course the question is, is that relevant now? I mean, even, even the, the kinds of words that I'm choosing now are, are sort of uh, more, uh, more apt for the situation now at hand rather than meeting someone on the street and, and you know telling them about what I do and what I work in and stuff. So they are often there at work in the background, so to speak. When are they relevant? When, when are they so sort of in the, in the foreground and uh, at the front and when should they be annotated? And I guess it w won't always be that easy to sort of uh, draw a line and say like, okay, this is where we annotated and this is where it's clearly not necessarily ne necessary to annotate it. And um, yeah, and then again, how will we have to annotate them? Uh, because they don't necessarily fit into the standard sort of valency type of annotation with frame elements realized, et cetera, that we've been using now. Uh, and that was it from my side for the first part.